Hello, everyone. Let's uh, last session of the day, last session of sector. So uh, I hope you'll find this enjoyable and you'll learn something and you'll have the desire to uh, go and do some hunting on your own afterwards. So what is this all about? Well, Internet of Things malware is very trendy right now. Yeah, you know, um, Brian Krebs got attacked and they, he actually, AKMI, removed his support for him and now he's protected by Google against a uh, distributed denial service attack. He's been commenting on uh, IoT malware for a long time. I have screenshots later for stuff that is uh, more than a year old. So uh, because of this attack and also the news breaking OVH 1.5 uh, terabyte per second uh, DDoS, uh, here we have a screenshot of a, a one terabyte attack from OVH uh, CTO. Uh, so this is, this is real, and he attributed it to cameras and DVRs. So because he's on the receiving end of the DDoS, he's able to you know, poke the IP address and look what kind of device and try to fingerprint them. So he, he attributed uh, more than 100 and almost 150,000 um, devices that were able to send uh, ups, upwards of 1.5 terabyte bit, terabit per second of traffic, which is really getting out of hand, it's, it's crazy. No one can withstand that amount of traffic, you know. Um, so uh, this is what this is about, looking at this, the, situ the security landscape around this uh, topic, this area. I've been studying um, this uh, IoT thing from a malware perspective since late 2014. Uh, I did a presentation on uh, Internet of Things threat uh, last May at ATL SecCon. Uh, we, um, we were lucky enough when I was working at ESET to actually have samples uh, of, uh, of IoT malware, and so we worked from the samples. But now uh, that I work at GoSecure and not an AV company, uh, having access to the binary files is harder. Uh, now we shifted our approach, and we now pro proactively collect uh, live, real-world things. So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, today. Um, here's our agenda for today. So we're, we're going to see the problem area of IoT malware, uh, how to collect those threats, uh, honeypots, which is the solution to uh, threat collection. Uh, we'll see some reverse engineering challenges specifically uh, related to IoT uh, malware. Uh, data analysis techniques, when you have honeypots, you have tons of logs, and I'll go through our tools for data analysis. Uh, we'll see some malware samples, so uh, in my abstract you saw that I, we will cover three case studies today of real-world IoT malware. Uh, we'll talk about the future and uh, takeaway. So who am I to uh, speak about all that? I'm a cybersecurity researcher at GoSecure. I used to do malware research at ESET for three years. Before that, I, was, uh, I also lectured at uni uh, ETS University in Montreal. Uh, what qualifies me to looking at IoT malware? Well, IoT is embedded devices. So uh, I used to do, uh, be a developer on Linux systems and a network administrator and a Linux sysadmin. So for me, this type of threat makes a lot more sense from a reverse engineering standpoint than actually <laughs> Windows malware, because I'm a lot more familiar with this. Uh, I also uh, do security for fun out of uh, uh, office hour. Uh, I co-founded Montreal Hack, which is a hands-on security workshop where we, we train on real CTF exercises uh, every month, every third Monday of, a, of a, every month. And uh, I'm, I'm also uh, uh, on the council of the NorthSec Security Conference in Montreal, uh, which is a, the kind of a conference and capture the flag competition at the same time. Both of the uh, initiatives are easy to find in Google, and I advise you to come and participate. I spoke at uh, 44Con this year, uh, at Virus Bulletin last year, BotConf, DerbyCon, DefCon, so uh, I, I'm used to, to do that. Uh, what is the problem area? What are the specifics of the IoT behind the, the hype, the, you know, the buzzwords and the headlines? Well, we're talking about embedded systems with small CPU, memory, and cheap. So the cost uh, to build them must be low, and the cost for the software side of it also must be low. So they're also thinking about support costs. So they don't want to have a lot of calls of, oh, what is the, the, the password on the device? So they're really focusing on low cost uh, technology and uh, structure, price structure. Uh, we're talking about something networked, either Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or Ethernet. 
generally running Linux. And for me, the most important aspect through my research and my um, uh, knowledge that I've gathered over the last few years at that is the, the lack of a UI, the no uh, general purpose UI. You usually have a web interface, but there's no like com uh, desktop UI, if you want. Uh, the really problematic IoT, so it's not the Bluetooth one, it's not this one who will participate in a botnet. You know, your, uh, your uh, cam not camera, but the light bulb, which is controllable via Bluetooth, it doesn't expose Telnet or SSH. It's not reachable from the internet. So it's not the, this, these type of devices that are really problematic. The ones which are problematic expose Telnet or SSH. They have a full user land, so uh, a busy box, which is a, a complete shell where you can do ping and wget and run commands and uh, Linux user land. It usually has default uh, global credentials, so admin admin can get you in the, the, these type of systems, uh, as opposed to per device generated credentials. So the, the industry for the Wi-Fi uh, password, for example, they now generate a password custom to each router. So they have this process in place, but for the admin, it's still admin admin that gets you in. So again, this is problematic because the, the list of passwords, you have to try to uh, compromise a device which was not, uh, the password was not changed, is really short. Um, the, the, the problematic devices are also the ones that can be plugged on, it, on the internet and specifically the ones that can be plugged backwards on the internet. A lot of people will say, oh, I need to access my IP camera from the internet. Let's just put a switch there instead of a NAT router, plug it in there. And so it's kind of was not thought to be deployed that way, but people actually deploy it that way because they can and because they don't understand the consequences. The, the, when I mean a general purpose UI, I mean um, not the web interface or the mobile interface I, uh, or completely, uh, or the lack of an interface uh, completely. So it's not, uh, it's problematic because you cannot really investigate a malware incident without a user interface. You need some sort of way to be at the same privilege level of the malware and understand what's going on, trace it, debug it, and stuff like that. So the lack also of a, a general uh, UI has implications like uh, that you cannot run third-party software on an IoT device. It's really a wall garden, a stack controlled by the, the device maker, which means that there is no endpoint security software. Uh, I know people like to bash on AV uh, like it's the, the trend for the last, I would say, what, 10 years. Uh, but people still pay for AV and, sh and should still pay for it. AV is important because AV, they, they find and they collect the malware sample. So the, the, the AV that you run on your desktop will actually collect files that are similar looking to clean, uh, not clean files, but uh, potentially malicious files, and a human will analyze them. This is the, 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 the basis of the, the fight against the malware, because the industry then shares all the samples between them through VirusTotal or other private means which means that if there is no third-party security software on your IoT device, there's no one who is actually collecting the samples, and we uh, are in the dark, if you want. So because of these things, um, our investigation on IoT is very different than your usual desktop, mobile, or server-side threats, where you all have a, a collection, uh, also a collection of samples through uh, security software, you also, uh, on desktop and mobile, you also bring the malware in. You uh, interact with a, a web page, usually, and you will infect yourself that way. Uh, on IoT, there is no UI, so the bad stuff needs to reach in via administrative channels like Telnet or SSH, as, pre as I previously mentioned. Uh, and however, malware-specific threats will also affect servers due to this uh, particularity. Um, we'll see examples later about that. So our first problems that we're going to uh, analyze today is having access to the binary samples. So since there is no um, uh, general purpose interface, how can you do a malware investigation and actually try to understand what's going on? Well, you can solder a serial port, a UART, sorry, a UART port on the, on the router that you're trying. This is, uh, for example, a TP-Link router. 
and then you will get a root shell from that uh, access. But this requires actual ha hardware, and it doesn't scale. You, you cannot do large-scale collection or analysis if you have to do this all the time. Uh, and uh, also, it won't work on uh, hardened devices, like uh, ATM, uh, point-of-sales uh, uh, systems, which are, have temper-evident uh, protections. So it's uh, not something that is scalable if we want to do large-scale study of IoT malware. We can ask nicely for files, but the problem with that is people don't even realize or know they are infected, again, because they, they ran the, the only way they get notified if they are infected through IoT malware is their internet runs slowly, or the ISP tells them you are infected and tells them to unplug everything and plug things uh, back one item at a time and then try to investigate what's going on there. So extraction um, requires specialized knowledge. I was, uh, after a talk I did at Virus Bulletin, someone saw it online, and uh, he actually shipped me a router uh, at my house where I did the extraction and tried to find if there was a, a malware on it. So this, again, is not a process that scales uh, very well. So finding a way in, again, as I previously mentioned, uh, most malware gets in via Telnet or SSH and default creds. So you can always reuse that path. But the problem is that it could be tampered with. They, since you run at the same privilege level as them, it's not something that you can guarantee that uh, you, you are not being lied to if you want. And it's illegal. So if I would hunt malware samples on the internet, connect on telnet machines, and try to extract processes and see if they are clean or malware, this is not something I'm willing to do, unfortunately. But it could be done. Uh, there's also something that the uh, security industry does is uh, hunting on virus total. So you run uh, Yara rules, uh, which specific <coughs> characteristic of the stuff you are trying to find, and you upload them on virus total. Virus total automatically run the Yara rules on all the new samples in their huge collection. And you can also do reach row hunting, which is another feature for the uh, paying customer of virus total which allows you to uh, run Yara rules on older sample, but uh, it relies on individuals that are submitting samples, so people with the specialized knowledge that we mentioned previously, them uploading the files to VirusTotal. So in reality, what happens is that we, we, d we noticed that no one was act actively sharing uh, very different or interesting samples on VT. It was always, a, it was kind of a, feedback loop, echo chamber. If you would see a blog post about Lizard Squad, then you would see a ton of Lizard Squad samples, all compiled with different timestamps, so they're actually the same thing, or someone added a feature, removed another feature. Nothing really interesting, nothing new that would stand out. Always the same, the same type of things. Uh, on VirusTotal, what we've tried uh, somewhat successfully was to look specifically for ELF binaries that are of the MIPS or ARM architectures. But again, we had tons of files and mostly all the same. And you had to go through LS, you know, binary, and realize, oh, this is just LS, it's not malware. You have no indication otherwise. So uh, the solution to this problem that we, uh, we are um, uh, believing in it at GoSecure is actually uh, honeypots. The problem with honeypots is that they are complex. So what are honeypots, quickly? It's a system that lures at attackers into showing how uh, they operate, including uh, the files that the, the, um, that the bad guys will upload on your honeypot. So we decided to uh, choose a honeypot. A different uh, type of uh, kind of choices that we have in front of, of us is, do we do a hardware-based hardware one? Since we are dealing with IoT, we could emulate the whole thing with, with the hardware. But uh, quickly, as everyone here will probably come to the same conclusion quickly, is uh, the maintenance, the monitoring, and geographic limitations, because when you study malware, it's interesting to see what's going on in Brazil versus Russia and stuff like that. Uh, it makes it uh, not really interesting. Um, also, the, when evaluating software, it's not all perfect, because it's arguably slower. slower sorry. It can be fingerprinted, so fingerprinted means that someone could uh, know that or make your system tell that it's a honeypot so it's not the real thing so you can always find one way one bit that it will be different in the headers or stuff like that that will allow you to detect that it, you are actually dealing with a 
uh, software based on iPod. So this is a, definitely a caveat. The advantage that we have right now is no one is expecting to be uh, trapped in a honeypot, so we kind of uh, see little honeypot detection techniques, but we still saw some, as I will uh, touch on later. Uh, so software one is just more flexible, cheaper, can be deployed on the cloud, so it's pretty obvious at, at this time. Uh, there are types of honeypot, low interaction and high interaction. Uh, the low interaction doesn't give you a real uh, shell access. It gives you kind of a lexer and stuff is emulated, so you can always find ways. Um, so since the bash or the, the busy box environment is a very rich common line environment, there's always ways that the malware can try to use Boolean logic and stuff like that that the honeypot needs to mimic. So it's kind of an arm, arms race. You look at your logs and you realize, oh, I need to support this feature because this malware is trying to use it. And we, we'll see later uh, the type of logs that we're gathering, uh, and you'll see why, I mean, you need a good lexer. Uh, but uh, compared to a high interaction honeypot, they are a lot less um, attention uh, needy. Uh, you, don't, you can forget about them for weeks, and you, you're, you, you won't actually run uh, elf binaries and infect the cloud architecture that you are running it on. So it kind of feels a lot safer to use um, this type of honeypot. Uh, so uh, you have less chance of becoming part of the problem. So we decided, now that we decided on a, a low interaction honeypot, we actually decided to build kind of a, a set of components that we hooked together for, the, for our honeypot. So we have um, a real Linux uh, QMU, uh, infected setup which uh, runs the, the uh, ARM architecture. So we are able to put in their real binary files uh, that will get executed. Uh, we put that in front of a, a man-in-the-middle proxy and these components will be developed later. Uh, we use IP tables to forward the things to the different uh, port that we need so we, we actually hide SSH and then route SSH through the uh, Kaui uh, low interaction honeypot so that our real SSH is still available to the, the system but a fake SSH is running on port 22. We, uh, there's a typo in there, it's dumb cap. We use dumb cap to uh, do a full packet capture of the whole environment. So in case something is missing in the logs or we're not sure what's happening, are we being fingerprinted, we can always go and have the raw data in the, the, log, uh, the, the full packet capture environment. And so this is in a nutshell the environment we, that we've built. Uh, all of this is uh, open source and free software. Uh, so the component, we decided to use dump cap for the packet capture. It's kind of a TCP dump, but made by the Wireshark pro project. Uh, better, uh, a more modern uh, text user interface, and uh, it has a privilege separation, so you less chances of uh, being um, exploited. Uh, we use QMU plus a Debian base image for the, the ARM environment. So the Debian image is Aurel's uh, ARM um, images, which is a full uh, Linux system, if you want, on the, of the ARM architecture. We um, decided to go with uh, Kauri for the honeypot, and I'll talk a, a bit more about uh, Kauri. For the HTTPS man-in-the-middle, uh, we use man-in-the-middle proxy. This is a component that is not strictly required, but for one of our investigations that I'll cover later, was required, so this is why I, I stick it in there, since it's part of our system. And uh, we needed the, the, the honeypot to be standalone, and what I mean by that is, if my honeypot ever gets compromised, I didn't want the bad actors to be able to trace it, to trace it back to me. So I needed it to be like throw away, like if something goes wrong, I delete it and never existed. And this is another, another reason why you want that, is that maybe the, the, the provider hosting your cloud instance will, you probably more or less breach the term of service with them by doing that. So, in case something happens, then you, you not lose all your files and you, st you still have um, your stuff. So the, the idea of standalone is really no, uh, no pushing back to the mothership. We, I always fetch stuff with SSH keys and I fetch uh, the logs and the PCAPs daily. And so if it ever blow up, I just recreate another one. So it's a DevOps if you want strategy, I guess. Um, we evaluated a few uh, honeypot. So there was uh, Kauri, Kippo. Uh, Kauri is actually a fork of Kippo. Uh, Hornet, HoneyD. Uh, Kauri is uh, uh, built in Python uh, uh, based on the twisted framework, so asynchronous I.O. and all the fancy, fast stuff. 
Uh, it includes an emulated file system, uh, and you can modify the output of the commands that are emulated really easily. It's all text files on a, s a specific directory. So it's, it's really easy to make it look like a router, because initially it will look like a server, but uh, you can make it look like a router or an insulin pump if you want. Um, it's actively maintained and has a nice log replay mechanism where you see actual typing of the commands in real time on the, the SSH uh, interface. So it's kind of, uh, you, you get kind of a nice feeling. You, you get to see, oh, is it a script or a human interacting with my system, which is, which is kind of cool. Uh, since it's over SSH, your, your uh, uh, packet capture is useless, so that the fact of having that log is actually quite necessary. The only disadvantage of uh, Kauri was that it didn't do uh, Telnet, didn't support Telnet. But for uh, our investigation, it was, it was key. So what uh, I decided to do is, during the, the holiday season last year, you know, there is less management, and you get to choose what you want to do more. And so I decided, hey, I'll implement Telnet support for the Kauri project. And this is what I did. It got merged uh, a few uh, months ago by the, the maintainer of Kauri. So it's Go Secure's contribution to the community. Uh, and it, it's nice because now, since it's upstream, everyone benefits from it. And uh, it's actually maintained by more than just me now. So uh, it, it took quite some work because of the way Twisted uh, works. And it's still not perfect. But uh, it's cool. And since the Krebs story broke out, everyone is talking about running uh, Kauri on uh, Telnet to see what, what is going on with the IoT DDoS malware. So uh, I mean, this is pretty good timing right here. Some mistakes that we've made through our components that we chose. Uh, I started using Docker because containers are cool and you need that. Uh, I wanted to be like the cool kids. Uh, but it turned out that uh, some VPSs are using OpenVZ which uh, pretty much is in conflict with the, the, the features required by Docker to do proper uh, namespacing. Uh, also, other VPSs had older kernels that were not supported. So it turned out that I needed to support two different sets of services, one that were Dockerized and other that weren't Dockerized. And since the machines are standalone and I can always delete it and create another one, I decided just, ah, let's... Let's forget isolation and just go uh, YOLO mode. Um, so this was a mistake as I lost quite some time in there. And I found some limitation on Docker and stuff. But it should be better uh, soon. Uh, for the HTTPS man in the middle, we had a choice. So uh, one of the malware does SOX, uh, a proxy HTTPS traffic through a SOX proxy. So this is kind of a very specific use case where, where I want to connect at the end of the SOX tunnel and then man in the middle this so that uh, I can intercept and have the raw HTTP traffic. Uh, I, I evaluated pe better cap and man in the middle proxy. Some uh, friends uh, of the pen test community told me better cap is, is very, very good, so you, you got to try that. I patched uh, better cap first disabling uh, HSTS bypass because HSTS relies on a DNS trick. And since I'm in a SOX proxy, I cannot trick the DNS because the, the DNS is actually performed on the client end of the tunnel, which I don't control. Um, and I noticed after my, the, my, my patching, I mean patching, I mean I, like I added eight comments somewhere in a, in a big if. It should have been an option. It, it was just not an option. Uh, so I noticed uh, it, it kept crashing after a few days. But uh, even if it would crash, I wouldn't mind that much. The real problem with better kept for my use case was that there is no way to have the, the unencrypted traffic other than in a free form text format. So for me, when I wanted to uh, man in the middle traffic for months, and I want to be able to do analysis on the, 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 the flow, the gets, and the request, the structured data, it was not uh, an option. So uh, really bad uh, choice. I, I switched to man in the middle proxy. It's stable. It's been running for months in some instances without any crashing. The problem with it is, and I understand now why my friend recommended me a better cap, is that it doesn't do IP tables on its own. You need to be able to manage the firewall yourself. And this guy is not a very good network admin, so I understand why now. Uh, it comes with a library uh, which does the parsing, and it extracts the data for you. The file format is quite simple. It's not JSON, but almost. Uh, and it's not pickle, uh, Python pickle, so it's, it's more secure. 
uh, which is very interesting. The, li the library uh, to parse the, uh, the logs is so high level that even non-technical people at work actually were doing the, the, the intelligence and uh, extraction of what is the content of the, of the data. So it's really well done. Uh, for the uh, full packet captured, I already told you about these. Uh, another nice trick, yeah, do automatic rotation of your logs, of course, uh, so that they don't go to grow too big. Uh, another trick is to move SSH to a non-standard port and filter it out. Otherwise, you have a feedback loop effect of when you pull your PCAP or your logs, they go in SSH, and if you dump SSH, your PCAP will just grow grow and grow and grow, and you don't understand why, and at some point, you're like, uh, I cannot download this anymore. Uh, so filter out your real SSH, which is hidden away. The reverse engineering problems. The biggest problem regarding reverse engineering, the IoT malware, is when we're dealing with statically linked strip binaries. Um, so uh, what are these uh, specific type of F ELF binaries is that you have no imports. So everything is uh, more or less inlined inside the binary which makes the file larger, but it means that it will run on any Linux kernel. Because Linux is backward, at the Cisco level, Linux is backward compatible until like, I don't even know. Uh, it's, it's old enough that it runs on e everywhere. But the, the, so the, the, more or less what is bundled in together is the C library. And the C library can be quite huge, even on embedded system. We're talking like around, 130k of code, uh, pure code, which is a lot of code, if you think about it. Um, the, the, the disassembler uh, doesn't help much, so uh, just to give you a sense of what you have to deal with is, uh, these are all functions, you have no idea what they do, you have no debugging symbols, and so you would need to reverse engineer from the start to up to each function to understand what, what it is doing. So this is 33 function out of 500. So this is only a, a subset of what you would actually have to reverse engineer. And it's not simple code to analyze. This is an example. Uh, these are all, uh, every box is a function. And this is the printf family of, of, of calls. And so if we explode the vprintf graph, you have a graph like this. Again, all the boxes are functions. And if we go deeper and look into one function. How does it look like in assembly? It's like this. So this is the vfprintf function, and you, you need to reverse engineer all of this without any symbols to finally understand that you reverse engineer printf. So this is really not scalable at all. You need to focus on the malware code, of course. Um, so. Uh, the ecosystem makes it even worse for reverse engineering because the, the, the C library are always changing. Uh, so the compiled libraries change based on compiler and C library. There are uh, little IDA flirt signatures. So the IDA flirt support is really good on Windows and on server-side Linux of, of the x86 GCC variants. But uh, otherwise, uh, there, there are not a lot of signatures available. And you can have various C libraries for the embedded system. You see libc, eglibc, jlibc, muzzle, uh, and stuff like that. At first, what I tried to do is to map syscalls with an IDA script, which is linked in the slide, will be available for you. Um, but the, as you saw, the syscalls are too low level, so you still need to re reverse engineer all that code. There is a little hint about the position of the code that can help you. You know, you try to find the, 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 the address uh, space where it's uh, actually library code and not uh, the, the main program. But still, this could be uh, further obfuscated or made harder for you if the, um, the bad guys would ever know that we use that trick. Uh, so still too much code to uh, RE. So what I, uh, I, I recommend people doing is you reproduce the environment out of the strings that you have access to. So, or the, target, uh, the targeted device. So architecture, libc, and compiler version. You build the same libraries with symbol under the same conditions. So one of the best tool chains to do that is uh, the OpenWRT ecosystem, which a lot of the bad guy target uh, because it runs everywhere. Uh, and then you use bindiff, which is now free uh, from um, uh, Google, uh, to map the library function. And you can then focus on the, the malware code. So, it sounds complicated, but it's actually pretty easy. And I'll show you what, uh, what this gives. Is, so on the one hand, you have the function that uh, is a sub and an address, whatever, you don't understand. 
And on the other end is your binary that you added the symbols to it. And you can see that the similarity is 99%. The, the confidence that the similarity is not wrong is 99%. And the, the function is named v uh, f printf internal. So you can mass import the symbol into the, um, your, your IDA samples that you're working on. And with this, then on the only remaining functions that are called sub with an address will be the functions that you need to look at, the malware code. So this mapped out the whole C library for you. Of course, you need to do that with other um, uh, big libraries. Like for instance, if your uh, malware supports uh, uh, HTTPS, it most likely either has a proxy or has OpenSSL bundled in. Then you will need to do the same thing with OpenSSL. Uh, in this example, uh, it was a uclibc 0.9.33 from the OpenW uh, toolchain. Uh, you, uh, this is the Linux Moose uh, malware. Uh, I was able to import more than 225 functions with high confidence, high similarity. So other reverse engineering problems that you can encounter is the, the constraint of the, enver the environment where the malware is running uh, makes it that you cannot do easy dynamic analysis. So if it's not something that you could emulate easily using QMU, then uh, it's a lot harder to be able to, uh, to analyze. And then you need to engage with people specialized in embedded system developments. development. Sorry. Uh, and right now it's not that bad because there's not a lot of anti-debug and anti-analysis focus uh, by the bad guys, but I'm sure as more researchers will get into this game, uh, the thing, th things will change, will get worse. Another problem that, because uh, it's a lessons learned talk, you know, uh, is on data analysis. So the, the, um, the, the size, the, the volume of the data is really important. You get scanned as soon as you put a telnet out there, you get scanned within a few minutes and all the time. So you will have large PCAPs, a lot of logs. Uh, I've been collecting them for months, which doesn't help the size problem. And I distributed it, uh, I distributed the environment in several countries. Um, what we decided to do, and we, we kind of experimented, but finally uh, uh, do in, uh, in reality, is we use a, cen a, a centralized single server who pulls all the files on it. And then we use a IPython notebook as a collaborative IDE. IPython notebook is a web interface to do, uh, that runs an IPython kernel. So it's kind of a code block that you can uh, uh, a rich uh, REPL environment where you can you know, control enter and it will run the Python code that is in there and show, show you the output right below which is good because then I could um, uh, do with the interns like, hey, try this block of code and, and, and experiment uh, with them. Uh, Python is not, has not the reputation of being the most scalable thing out there, but uh, there are scalable libraries available. Uh, Pandas, NumPy, SciPy uh, are, are some of them. Um, the, for example, uh, reading and writing CSV file, the, the library, uh, from Panda is insanely faster than using the built-in uh, Python one. I also tend to parallelize uh, all the CPU or HIO heavy task uh, using uh, inde uh, independent script, which I call from the IPython kernel, and I use GNU Parallel. GNU Parallel is like XARGs for those who are not familiar with it, but it just it finds out how many cores you have and it will automatically do a job per core without having you type anything. So it's really, really cool to do. Uh, what I do with it is uh, my T-Shark uh, log analysis. So I, I have one-liners with T-Shark who extract the data I'm interested in, collected through uh, parallel, so I actually crunch 12 uh, PCAP at the same time. And uh, it will do the reordering of the log and all that good stuff for you free, for free. Um, so I use uh, specific tools for specific data, T-Shark for PCAP, the man in the middle proxy library for the man in the middle proxy logs. Of course, in the future slide, I have a lot of uh, ideas because I know it's pretty medieval or low level type stuff right now. So let me uh, uh, get into story time. Uh, three cases of IoT uh, malware uh, stories. First is a MIPS dropper. Uh, so a dropper in the, the traditional malware is a piece of code that doesn't reveal any intention so that you're not, you don't know what the malware actually does. All it does is it fetches the, net, the next stage 
of the of the, the malware, which is good because it usually avoids honeypot, which is exactly what happens in our case. So it's a short uh, binary code, which is probably written by hand, uh, whose goal is to avoid the low interaction honeypot. It's, uh, this is all of it. Like this is really, really small. Um, uh, what it does is uh, it uh, creates a socket, connects to an IP port. It will loop. Uh, there's a one important loop in there. Uh, it will do a receive and then a write on a file descriptor. And then it will close, and that's it. So it's really, uh, really lean um, uh, code. But of course, uh, oh, this is uh, what it does. Uh, what, it, what, what is good? Well, not good, but the reason this thing exists is because it bypasses my honeypot. My honeypot does not execute uh, native elf uh, binaries. This is the reason why you go with a low interaction one. And so, uh, <coughs> Uh, this is why they, they are doing that. So what, what I need to do now is to actually, when I get a dropper drop at the same time, I should look at the sample, find the IP, and then connect and download the file to have the stage two, which I haven't done because I've been focusing on uh, the other stories. But this is something that we'll see in the future slide. Let me show you. Uh, oh, this is not going to work. So let me show you uh, a replay of that log. So what, I, what you saw is the binary file, but now I'll show you the, the way that uh, the malware, the, the, the infection happens. So, uh, whoops. So this is the, the, the tool I was talking to you uh, about earlier, playlog, which, which takes the, the log file, the binary log file of the Kauri system, and will replay it realistically. There's a, a, a bit of a glitch inside because it, Kauri doesn't do well the, the pipe redirection uh, of files, but you'll see anyway uh, what the operator is doing. So they got a shell, they echo welcome. So this is part of their fingerprinting of the environment that they are in. They will try to CD into temp, which will fail. They then try to echo, going too fast. All right, so the, the, it completed. Uh, okay, so what they do here is, is quite interesting. So this is inline data transfer. So instead of doing wget uh, uh, to fetch a binary file, which is something that Kaui support, Kaui will automatically set aside anything that, is, that you try to wget for you to analyze. So what they've done instead is they, they, they pass the data inline and they test it first. So they use echo-e and x file, and they realize, OK, this worked. So uh, ga gathering this output, it says, OK, I, I can infect uh, this environment, so I will continue. So they RM files that don't exist, but it's not really important. They touch a file, and they make it executable right here, schmud. And then uh, you see that the echo uh, file transfer uh, will happen. So N for no new line and E for evaluate the backslash uh, something. And then it will redirect it to drop. Now there is a few output glitches. There shouldn't be two backslashes and you shouldn't see the elf header here. It should all be hidden and file system artifacts and not in the, the console. But the, these are the, the little glitches I, I mentioned to you earlier. So now you see that the whole binary file is all in there. And then at the end, it will try to execute it. But because of the constraint of our environment, it, it will say command not found, and it will actually not execute it. So this is cool, because you see that the, e the evolution of the bad guys that now know or realize that they need to use stagers like they do on the Windows world for years. So this is the investigation is to be continued. I focused on Linux moves more, which I'm, I'm coming up uh, lately. I noticed that Mauer Must Die did a blog post this week on a similar dropper. I don't think it's the same one because they talk about strings, uh, specific strings, that, and this sample has absolutely no strings uh, in it. It's all uh, except the, the sections, strings, which are standard. But it could be the same thing. Another case I wanted to talk about is Lizard Squad. So Linux, Lizard Squad is actually uh, detected by antivirus as GAFGIT malware. 
And Lizard Squad is famous for their use of the, the kind of a fancy lizard uh, image. So this is a black hat hacking group. Uh, lots of distributed denial of service attack. Uh, it's the guys that did the uh, PlayStation Network and Xbox Live takedown in 2014. And uh, they did bomb threats also to uh, prominent people like the VP, Vice President of Sony Pictures or Sony um, PlayStation. Uh, they said that he, he was carrying a bomb and so they landed the plane and it, it was a, a mess. Uh, and this attracted them a lot of law enforcement uh, uh, interaction. And they were arrested in August of 2015. Well, at six of them. But again, on Twitter, they always say, ha, 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 you never took us down. We are, you know, uh, more than just people. We are uh, something greater or something. So I define them as little cyber rascals. So they're not, they're more annoying than anything. Uh, but with the latest DDoS, it's more complicated than that. But what is interesting me more than that is that the, the, when I realized that they are running all this on uh, hacked routers, home routers, which is the malware part, uh, so when I was tracking this tr threat, I realized that the source code for um, uh, GasGit was leaked and that there is a ton of versions, so PowBot, Hydra, Katen, are all kind of modifications on the same malware. So and there is probably a ton of other as the source is public. What it does is it has a Telnet scanner, UDP, TCP, junk and hold flooding mechanism, and it supports a lot of architecture, super H, which is like a uh, architecture for, oh, I'm sorry. That's why no one is laughing at my pictures. <laughs> I'm really sorry, okay, so, uh, lizard squad, the lizard. Uh, yeah, uh, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Cyber Rascals. And uh, Krebs, uh, who published in uh, January uh, last year uh, that uh, they were, it was embedded system malware, the different strain of malware that I, I looked at. And uh, so the architecture, I was going to say Super H, which is interesting because it only runs in like Toshiba cameras or stuff like that. Really rare architecture. IDA has really bad support for it. Uh, MIPS ARM x86 power PC. So you see x86. So this threat will also infect servers which means that we're not, when we're saying that it's uh, hacked home routers, we're kind of being misleading here. We're attacking embedded Linux, not even embedded, we're attacking Linux system which has a telnet uh, open and weak credentials. So the, the, in the server source code, we can see that they assume though that they will infect embedded systems because they stated in a new version that they now have refrigerator support. We're kind of proud of that. The attack vectors that they use is shell shock, SSH credential brute force, telnet credential brute force. Here's an example of the shell shock. So it uses, it relies on the CGI bin uh, that will eventually call bash and they do the, the, the famous shell shock signature here. And uh, the payload is a wget of a script. Interestingly, the script uh, will download wget all of the different malware samples and will try to execute all of them. So from a malware analyst perspective, this is great because I get to choose what binary I will reverse engineer. So I'm, if I'm more familiar with ARM, I choose to, to analyze the ARM binary. If I'm more familiar with MIPS, the MIPS binary, or even x86 because of the way they distribute their, their thing. They download all of the code that they have ever built and they try to run all of it. We've uh, studied other variants, some with HTTPS support, some with Cloudflare protection bypasses. Here's the Cloudflare bypass code, pretty complex. Uh, it has a, a lexer that will emulate the JavaScript challenge that is in the Cloudflare defensive mechanism. Of course, as soon as Cloudflare is aware of that, they can change the algorithm and they will probably have to re-implement uh, their, their support of it, but anyway. So what, is it sophisticated? Well, they were, their database was leaked, their, pa pa their passwords were stored in plain text for the lizard stressor service. So they're not, like, it doesn't seem all that coordinated or sophisticated. Um, there's the, the, the command and control uh, mechanism is via IRC. You can uh, log in and participate and list the amount of bots. So here, uh, the, this server had 2,000 bots. Um, you can see the bot masters and you can see them chat, uh, which is, again, uh, not that good uh, from an operation standpoint. 
Uh, the targets that, at the time that I studied this, uh, were all gamer-related targets. So uh, DSL lines, uh, game hosting company, Blizzard, and stuff like that. So they were trying to win a game by DDoSing the opponent, pretty much. Uh, so to wrap up Lizard Squad, since the source code was leaked, it is very prevalent and now operated by numerous unrelated actors, and it's still focused very much on DDoS and effective. Uh, Linux Moose. So Linux Moose uh, is a stealthy botnet who monetizes its activities by selling fraudulent followers on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and other social uh, networks. So it's very different than the other. It doesn't have x86 code at all, so they definitely want to stay under the radar. There is no per persistence, so if you reboot your router, you are no longer infected anymore. But they entered via weak credentials on Telnet, so they can still reinfect you at another point in time. Uh, we, I published an extensive report uh, when I was working at ESET on Linux Moose that was really technical. Um, building upon our 2015 report, we decided to do a step further. And this is why I had uh, HTTPS man in the middle attack in the, um, uh, built in the honeypot system. The, the way that they do the, the social media interactions is through a SOX proxy. So the SOX proxy is the middle layer. So you see that the TCP is end-to-end -end with the, uh, through the infected host. SOX proxy is kind of a virtual tunnel which will go through the targeted social uh, network. And they have HTTPS uh, running on top of the SOX tunnel, which means that I couldn't see what they were doing. I saw, because of the C name of the certificates, that they were reaching out to um, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and stuff like that. I had host name in the CN because this is in clear text but I couldn't see how they were interacting, who is buying, who are the fake accounts, and stuff like that. So what we did is, through our man in the middle, uh, th we, you see the weak, um, uh, the, the uh, lightish purple, and this is where we terminated at the, uh, after the infected host, the, the SSL connection, and we recreated a new one with the targeted social network. Uh, we, I used uh, certificates that were mimicking security appliances, because I was thinking, oh, they probably got errors all the time because it's a botnet on the internet with thousands of infected hosts. So if I, I, I say I'm a blue coat or I say I'm a checkpoint, next gen something, probably that they will just click, oh yeah, it's okay, it's okay, I need to, I need to do my botnet uh, thing. And that bet worked. So I had clear text traffic of all of the interactions of the, of the botnet. So, we did the, this attack for months, and we have a publication ready for Black Hat Europe in two weeks. Unfortunately, I cannot, uh, it's embargoed, so I cannot disclose more here. But uh, what we have found out is that they're running a stealthy and profitable botnet while advertising the services on the clear web. So they really sell directly to customer, even though it's an illegal operation. Um, and they sell uh, the, the, the follows or the likes to normal people. We studied like who was buying, and we found like models, singers, uh, you know, uh, musicians, and stuff like that. Uh, the paper is um, "Ego Market: When Greed for Fame Benefits a Large Scale Botnet," and it will be uh, uh, released uh, also on our blog and as a PDF format. So there will be a talk and all of that. So I encourage you to look that up in two weeks. Uh, future work around the honeypot. Well. For me, the most uh, interesting from a technical standpoint is I want to be able to collect the stage two samples automatically. So I'm thinking of using QMU in, a, in its uh, bin format mode to be able to run the elf with just the right amount of user code so that it will, it will obey the syscalls that I saw in the samples that I've analyzed. Uh, I want to emulate more type of devices. I'm thinking like Fortinet SSH, for example, with the, the backdoor key and see if someone's abusing it. Stuff like that. Uh, I want to make it harder to fingerprint. Thank you. Uh, on the data analysis side, I want to improve the visualization in the data analysis pipeline. Uh, I need some either Splunk or Elk or Greylog, something like that. Uh, I, Andrew Case's talk uh, this morning spoke, uh, uh, he said that uh, he was more encouraging me to use the Splunk stack, uh, the, sorry, the Greylog or Elk stack instead of Splunk. I still haven't decided yet. If you have an opinion on that or do similar work, please come and let me know. Uh, I found that Elk um, was a lot of manual configuration, and I'm sure that the security community could share some configs uh, to save time. 
For the PCAP analysis, I want to use uh, AOL's uh, Moloch, which is uh, an amazing uh, product that I've used at ESET at the time, uh, but I haven't got the time to uh, build that into our system. And I want to try IPython's built-in uh, parallelization API, which uh, also should improve um, the man-in-the-middle proxy log uh, analysis. Uh, for uh, reverse engineering, I have the, I hope to be able to build a flirt signature so that more embedded devices, architecture, uh, compilers, and C libraries are supported. Uh, of course, this will probably slow down the, the IDA uh, automatic loading process if it tries all of them, but I think we can strike a balance between like you put yourself into embedded reversing mode and then try some, uh, something like that. We'll see how that goes. Um, it's, I, I would love to do that in the next six months or something. Um, and uh, uh, last uh, future slide, if you want, is uh, I would like to fix the actual problem. As you uh, saw, it's not complicated. We're talking about default credential and exposed management uh, services. Uh, so uh, the, the vendors should do per device credential. They, it can even be the MAC address of the thing if it's written on it. I mean, I don't mind also if it's written, the password, on the device, because we're talking, you know, botnet, large-scale, automated. There's no manual people doing any of that stuff. Well, not at the honeypot I monitored. Um, and, uh, and be careful with the default management. And Telnet, I, if, the, if the DDoS situation continues to be as bad as it is lately, like with terabyte DDoS, I'm pretty sure that ISP will just seal Telnet off the internet. And maybe they should do that. You know, I know we hate it like, as technologists to have a, a band-aid like that, but I, I think the situation is getting so, so bad that uh, at some point it will be in inevitable. Uh, for consumer, put password on your devices, even if you have to write it down on a post-it on the device itself. But again, you know, I know my audience is not <laughs> consumers, so I'm talking in a, we're talking in our echo chamber again. Uh, takeaways, uh, IoT is insecure, but it can be fixed for the low-hanging fruit problems, like I just said. I want to continue actively collecting and then analyzing samples to know in advance what's coming next, to, so to be, you know, one step of ahead of what the um, embedded malware uh, community is doing. And so this is it. Thank you for uh, your patience and your time through this last presentation of the day.